students, staff, and members of our community to discuss these issues. This fall semester, we have a number of events planned which cover a wide range of topics, including history, women's studies, law, immigration, and music, and feature authors like Linda Cohn, the first full-time women sportscaster at ESPN, and artists like Al Vega, a local jazz legend. If you haven't already, I encourage you to pick up the full list of programs at our sign-in table in the front. And I also ask that you take time to fill out a comment card also at the front table uh, so we can gather your feedback and hear how we can improve our programs for the future. To help us continue to provide programs like today's talk, please consider becoming a library supporter today. For more information about supporting the library and about the university's Frank Palmer Spear Society, uh, more information is at our sign-in table. We are also filming today's event, which will be available on Northeastern University Library's YouTube and iTunes University channel. For more information about the library, our services, and upcoming programs, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Club Snell. Uh, so now for the fun part. Today's Meet the Author program features Lou Imbriano and is made possible by our co-sponsors, the Northeastern University Bookstore and the Northeastern College of Business and Administration. Books will be available for purchase and signing immediately following this talk, so make sure you pick up a copy. And I would also like to thank the Library's Programming and Communications Committee and Kelsey Strout, our Marketing and Events Co-op, who work hard to put this author series together for the semester. Lou Imbriano currently serves as President and CEO of Trinity One, a marketing agency specializing in the sports industry. Lou consults with sports teams, venues, and corporations around the globe on marketing and operational strategy, as well as new business development and social media strategy. As the former VP and CMO of the New England Patriots and Gillette Stadium for nine years and Chief Operating Officer for the New England Revolution for three seasons, Imbriano built powerful relationships that allowed the organization to achieve an increase in revenue by more than 600%. Lou has also appeared on numerous local Boston radio and television programs and has experience in radio and TV production. Some of you may have heard of The Phantom Gourmet. And he has also been profiled in Forbes.com as one of its names you need to know. Lou also wrote multiple columns for the Sports Business Journal and now speaks to colleges, businesses, and organizations across the globe. He teaches locally in Boston at Boston College, and, uh, which is his alma mater where he teaches sports marketing. Lou is here today to talk about his recently published book, Winning the Customer, Turn Consumers into Fans and Get Them to Spend More, in which he draws from his years of real world business experience to deliver strategies for successful sports marketing and how to, to achieve both short and long term <coughs> financial success. I know there are some students in the audience today who are interested in this field, so I encourage you to ask questions and talk with Lou after the program as well to learn more. So we're very excited to have Lou here today, and please join me in welcoming Lou and Brianna. Thank you, thank you. So I grew up in, oh, I'm loud. <laughs> I don't think I need this. Do you think I need this? Is this too loud for you? No, oh, you want to turn it down? Well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. It's good to see you all. How's the pizza? I'm Italian, if you didn't notice. And even though I went to BC, I'm a little husky. <laughs> so go Huskies. <laughs> I grew up in East Boston. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the Boston area, that's across the tunnel. And I grew up pretty poor. Our family didn't have a lot of money. My mother actually had to stretch my shoes and dye them another color to get to the next year of uh, classes in new, in, new, uh, in new shoes. But we lived in this three-decker dumbbell t uh, tenement on this uh, Italian neighborhood in East Boston. And down the end of the street was this little corner store called Marty's. Now, Marty's was like a butcher, and he had grocery milk and bread and all that other stuff. And it, wasn't, it was the time before super stops and, stop and shops and where Walmart was serving uh, and selling groceries. So that's where we got most of our, uh, our supplies. And I used to go down to Marty's, and Marty would say, Lewis, how are you today? How's everything going? Oh, man, I haven't seen you in a while. How's your little sister? She's great. Oh, man, she's terrific. She's so cute. And your mom, you know, I know she's out of work. And you're having tough times, but I'm going to put a little extra in the bag. And when she's back on her feet, then she can pay me. 
and your grandfather. And your grandfather was you know, under the weather, not doing well. How is he today? Is he better? I hope he has given my regards. And Marty would invest time in my family. He would know my family. He would understand them. And because of that, we were loyal to Marty. Now, at the end of the street, at the other end of the street, was a place called Frank's. Same great little corner store. Frank was a good dude, but we would never go to Frank's. Once in a while, we'd get something in the flyer, a flyer in the mail, and um, it would say 10% off, and, and money was important back then. But no matter how important it was, we still went down to Marty's because Marty was our guy, right? Marty was our guy. He spent time with us. He invested us. And this short, fat, bald Italian guy with a seventh, up to a seventh grade education was probably the best marketer around. No training, no marketing courses, no PhD, no big titles. But he got it. He got that connecting with his consumers and building relationships with his customers was really the key for them to come back more and more and more and keep coming back. So, from another short, fat, not so bald yet Italian guy from East Boston, it made me think that marketing is one of those things that isn't about the, these ancient secrets. It isn't about um, all these different principles and philosophies. It's really about being a relationship architect. And when I was at the Patriots, I told our staff, yeah, we sell signage and logo rights and promotions to recognize revenue, but the reality of it, it is we're relationship architects and we have to build relationships because it's not about your net worth, it's about your network. And I know that's probably sounds cliche, but there is more money in the relationships that you have, more power, more value than the actual money you have. Because if you can reach out to anybody at any time to connect, to get you into a better position, you are much better off than just having money. It's easy to buy things, but if you can get things and get people to rally around you, it's a huge difference. So everybody has a best friend, right? Yes, come on, yes, everybody has a best friend. And what usually happens when you have a best friend? That's something that comes from commonality, hanging out together, you know, like interest. And then over the course of time, it's not like when kids are in second grade and they're like, oh, dad, my kids used to come home all the time. Dad, dad, I met, I met Charlie. Oh, he's my new best friend. Well, it's not real. I mean, it's real for second grade and kindergarten, but in, in, in our age and high school, college and and beyond, it takes a long time to get a best friend because you've got to trust them. There's got to be credibility. You want to be able to rely on them. So it doesn't happen instantly like it does when you're in second grade. It happens over the course of time. What if I was here to tell you today that relationships don't have to be all about time, but they can be built by design. And you're not going to do that necessarily in your personal life, but in your business life, when things are so fast, think about how quickly things change, how fast things are coming at you. You don't have the time to build those best friend relationships. You need it done now. Not in six years, but in six months. But what if I told you that building relationships could be done by design as opposed to time? Because it can't. When I was at the team, we um, built the, the new stadium, and we had the club seats. And there was this club seat member, this little old man, really nice guy in his 70s, and didn't, you know, didn't dress flashy, drove like a little Cadillac, nothing special. And he was a club seat member. And we started to get to know him. We started to chat about him, with him and finding out more and more and more over the course of time, just because he was friendly. And over the course of six months, this little old guy who was unassuming, we come to find out he actually is a billionaire. To look at him, you would never know. But because we spent time, not the long period of time, but we invested time 
with him and asking him questions. We found out that he owned this company that was a laser company. Dow Chemical bought it for three billion dollars and he was the biggest Patriots fan anywhere. So now you have a billionaire who's a Pats fan with serious discretionary cash. Well there's a great business person to know and it's, it's a person that's probably going to fuel some of your business and I'll get to what, how he did at some point. So in order to build by design, we've come up with this little acronym that I think helps us get there, um, and it's called DELIVERS. So DELIVERS isn't anything earth-shattering. Okay? Everything that you're going to hear now, you're going to say, yeah, Lou, of course, I know that. I know how to build relationships. But DELIVERS is a discipline, because even though you know it, and even though you claim that you do it, we all know, we all have squandered relationships over the course of time. I've squandered them. You know, what's in it for me? Everybody's, what's in it for me? Why do I have to invest the time? Let's get to the point where someone's going to just give me something. It's not a smart way to approach it. So delivers is a great approach in order to help you build relationships, not over the course of time, but by design. And it's, it's, it's pretty simple. Dedication. Genuinely give of yourself. Be there when it's necessary regardless of being asked or not. Be worthy of people's trust, right? Pretty simple stuff. The second grade could know that stuff, right? However, how much and how often do you put, your, put the D's into your relationships? So you're young, right? Most people here are young. Who's, everybody's seniors, juniors, yeah? So eventually you're going to go out and get a job. And there's going to be a jerk like me who says, hey, I need you to fetch me coffee. And you're going to be like, four years of college to fetch coffee? Are you out of your mind? I'm not doing that. I'm above that, right? I'm above that. I think that's a mistake. Not because of any other reason, but everything you do in any relationship can be considered a test. And especially in a work environment, if someone gives you a task, as menial as it is to go fetch coffee, if they ask you for a cream and two sugars and you come back with milk and nothing else, well, if you can't handle fetching coffee, why would they ever give you something of real meaning and real importance? It's a great opportunity, as simple as it is. Your dedication in fetching coffee could be the difference in your next promotion. But people don't think of it that way. Some do. I had this guy who worked for me, his name is Will McDonough. Actually, he was 15 years old. And when I was at the radio station, I ran marketing, and he came to me to come be an intern. And Will, man, he was ready cash. He was on the ball. He got it at that young age. I would say to him, what are you doing on Saturday? And he would say, what do you need me to do? That's the dedication I'm talking about. Not the stuff that's, you know, everybody, oh yeah, I'm dedicated. Oh, I do it all the time. No, it's that dedication where you're paying attention. And that's what delivers is. Paying attention to make sure you're hitting all the letters in order to achieve that relationship where it's unbreakable and you move forward. Will left the radio station as an intern, went to BC, Called me up and said, I need an intern at the Patriots. I was at the Patriots at the time. I need an internship. What was my answer right away? You got it. Come on in. I ended up hiring him. He became the liaison to the players. Became pals with Tom Brady. Now he runs all Tom Brady stuff. Because he was dedicated. It's that simple. Now, E, you, you need energy. Okay, people, this is one that usually goes past because... There's a lot of folks that, you know, you met, uh, you've been with your best friends. And you're like, what do you want to do tonight? I don't know, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? Right? How many times does that happen? No. You've got to be up. You've got to be positive. People don't want to be hanging around boring people, right? So, but, you know, it's not easy. I had a bad day. Man, my professor kicking the crap out of me. Got a C. I'm bummed out, I want to just curl up in my bed and go to sleep, right? Those things happen. I don't feel good, I got a cold. 
If you're going to pay attention to a business relationship and you're going to make it work, you can't succumb to those things. You have to rise above it. You have to have the energy so they know you mean business. It's not easy, but you've got to pay attention to it. Loyalty. Now, loyalty is thrown around like a bad penny. How many people here all the time have heard, oh, yeah, I'm loyal. Oh, I'm loyal to You know what? Loyalty these, these, <laughs> in these days, are out, it's out the window. People will sell you shorts to get ahead. Right? People, don't, people are out for themselves. And I don't want to, I'm generalizing, of course, because there's some good people out there. But there's many people who look at loyalty in much more of a flimsy way. But the reality of it is, you have to be trustworthy. You have to do what you say you're going to do. You can't be wishy-washy and cavalier. You've you got to be loyal to the relationship. And it's different than the normal stuff. When it's crunch time, you need to be there. And a lot of people are like, eh, do I have to? Really? I got other crap to do. But in a business relationship, you got to stop and pause and say, okay, I really don't want to do this. It's not because I don't like the person. It's just I got other things going on. But maybe I should stop, pay attention to this, and get to it. So I'm spelling out delivers. I'm, I'm pretty bad at spelling, but this is easy because it's, it's up on the screen. So invest. Now, when I talk about time and investment, I don't mean the course of long time. I mean, I mean spending actual time paying attention to the relationship. Re use your resources, your experiences. Know your relationship and what it demands. Who knows the golden rule? Right? Who knows the golden rule? All right, so what's the golden rule? Yeah, my grandmother always told me that. Guess what? She's wrong. The golden rule is garbage. Forget the golden rule. Don't treat others the way you want to be treated. Treat others the way they want to be treated. Because there's a difference. What I like, what I want, is very different than what all of you guys like to want. It's just the way it is. And how do you know what other people want? You have to invest in them. You have to pay attention to what they're... I'm using this word pay attention a lot. And there's a reason. Because this is all stuff everybody knows. But they don't pay attention to it. So investing time in people means knowing what they like, knowing what they dislike, and giving it to them or not. So the golden rule, to me, is garbage. It's nice, but it's not real. Who likes Bruce Springsteen? Yeah. So you know this guy, Stevie Van Zandt? If you watch The Sopranos, he was on that as well. I'd left the Patriots, we started this uh, company, Trinity One, and we were working with a lot of teams, and we had a NASCAR team that was a client, Richard Childress Racing. And we were down in North Carolina, and um, we're down in the pits, and who shows up is people who work with little Stevie. And we were with the guys that Richard Childress, who make, they're making the introductions, and they say, you know, John, you have to meet Lou. Lou's in the business. Maybe there's ways you can do business together. And again, that's a great way to build relationships through other friends and pals and recommendations. So I meet John, and John's like, yeah, I like what you have to say. He was digging what we were talking about. He's like, would you come to New York and meet Stevie? So I'm like, sure. So I know Stevie's uh, with Bruce Springsteen, and I know he's, he's on The Sopranos, but guess what? Everybody else does. So it doesn't make me any special if I say, hey, you're on The Sopranos. Now I'm a groupie, right? I'm a fan. <laughs> so I, at the Patriots, we devised this profiling system. I know profiling has a bad connotation, but it was really a system to take folks, put them in a database, understand their likes, their dislikes, and everything we're talking about investing. So we had it in a, in a binder form, and then we converted it to a web-based uh, application where every time we communicated with somebody, every time we found out information, it went in the system. So as you were talking to people, and, and when you had meetings, you knew the kids turned 17, this one went to this college. All the stuff that's important that you know when you have a best friend because you're always talking. But I don't care how good you are, how smart you are. If you don't have a system to capture this stuff 
and you have hundreds of business relationships, it's, it's impossible to keep it all in your head because it all kind of merges together. So we would have the system, and every time prior to a meeting, we would review. We took that same type of system to Trinity One, and so prior to this meeting, my staff did a bunch of research, found out information about Stevie. It was the first meeting, so I don't have to know everything, but you want to show that you've paid attention and invested time in him. So they give me this big binder. I'm like, yeah, it's too big, you know. Give me a little executive summary, and I'm going through it on the plane, and I'm looking through it, and I'm like, it's, it's just nothing's clicking. I open it up. I start d digging deeper, and I find out some things. But there was one thing that was interesting to me. One of his right-hand guys, this guy John, who was a radio and music producer, produced the song Love in the Elevator by Aerosmith. So Aerosmith's a Boston band, and it kind of just, oh, yeah, Boston. It it's stuck in my head for some reason. I didn't think I was going to use it, but it was in there. So we meet with Stevie in New York, and he's just larger than life. I've got to unbutton my, my, my jacket, because if I don't, I'll bust it open. So Stevie's like, he's all over the place. He's doing this. He's going crazy. Yeah, Lou, how you doing? Oh, and he's just wild. And in a good way, you know, athletes, talent, they're just they're larger than life. So we're talking, and I'm, you know, I'm pitching, and I'm, I'm giving him what we're all about, and I'm bringing him to the River of Dreams, and I'm going to get him ready to drink. And then who comes out is John. And John walks by and he's like, John, John. And now Stevie the whole time is saying, hey, you're the money man. You're the money man. You, you're the money man. Because I was weird at the Patriots. We did sponsorship. So we, we generate a lot of revenue. So he's thinking, I'm going to do the same for him. He's the money man. He's the money man. So John walks by. <laughs> and Stevie goes, John, 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 John. You got to come here. You got to meet the money man. You got to meet the money man. So he comes over. He's like, hey, I'm John. I'm like, geez, your name sounds familiar. You produce Love in the Elevator by Aerosmith. Stevie's mouth dropped. He's like, how do you know that? I go, I'm the money man. I have to know that. You're hired. You're hired. You're hired. <laughs> now, I think I probably would have got the gig anyway, but that sealed the deal. So that little extra investment, that time, it makes a big difference. If somebody knows something about you, you feel connected. Right? Right? That was a fun, that's a fun story. He's not a client anymore. <laughs> so vision. Okay, we're going to, we'll, we'll crank through these a little bit quick. Understand what relationships should be. Know, where, know how it's mutually beneficial. Don't be contriving scheming. Okay. So I'm telling you to do this by design. I'm not telling you to be phony. I'm not telling you to act. I'm not telling you to make things up. I'm, you still need to be genuine. You still need to be real. And whether it's a janitor or a CEO, you have to invest in that relationship because you never know where that next great relationship is going to come from. That janitor might be brother-in-law for a CEO of a company, and he can make the introduction that's going to be your next big gig. So whether it's a janitor or a CEO, it shouldn't matter. It's the relationship. Every relationship, look at it as it's an opportunity. Every relationship could mean something. Now, because time is not on our side and we're doing so many things, you still have to put these meetings in buckets. And you still have to have vision to know where it could go. The relationship can bounce from bucket to bucket. You meet me the CEO and you're like, okay, I'm gung-ho, I'm going to try to make a, a, a stronger relationship. And you come to find out it's not going where you want it to go, so you can back off a little bit. But you've got to have vision. Put each relationship, each new person you meet into a particular bucket, and then start paying attention to the relationship. If you don't, and if you treat everybody exactly the same, you're not going to have enough time on your hands in order to really make it productive for you. But the key is not to be phony. The key is to be real. I'm throwing in a bonus E here on Deliver. Entertain and engage. Right? So you have to engage with people. You have to entertain them. Right? You have to create memorable moments. Your best friend in the world is probably multiple times where you're like, oh, remember that time? That was awesome. We had a blast. And every time you think of that time, you think of the person. So in business, 
if you create memorable moments, the same thing's going to happen. Oh, geez, I was with Lou that time. That was great. We had a ball. Who's been to Patriot games? Anybody? The new stadium or the old stadium? New stadium. So if you've been to Patriot games, you know prior to the game, players run out of this big inflatable helmet, right? Kind of fun. So at the Patriots, we were pretty good at creating memorable moments. We'd invite people to the game. They'd come up to the suite. We'd take them down on the field. They'd watch pregame, warm-ups. Mr. Kraft would come by. We'd take pitches. It's pretty, you know, fun stuff. It, it, a little special and exclusive. Doesn't happen to everybody. And then there was these two or three people who were big, important clients that we really wanted to impress and we wanted them to remember us. So I'd go over to them and say, hey, listen, we don't do this for everybody. Come with me. And I'd come in, I'd bring them, I'd walk around, and I'd bring them right in here. See right in here where they're standing, right inside the helmet where the players are? And then prior to team running out, the players would be getting all jacked up. We're going to win! We got this one! We got this one! We're going to get this going! And then the music would start coming in the background. And they're jumping, they're getting, they're jumping up and down. They're getting all jacked up. It's just wild. It, the feeling in that helmet is indescribable. And then, all of a sudden, Ozzy Osbourne starts screaming, and the players start running out. And the dude over here, who's the CEO of a company, they're running by and they're high-fiving them and slapping them. And he's like, oh my God, where am I? This is unbelievable. And the small, this guy who was CEO of a multi-billion dollar company is putty in my hands. Because as they're running by, pictures are being taken. And who's right next to that CEO? Me. Memorable moment. Okay, I know, you're sitting there right now saying, but Lou, we don't have a big inflatable helmet. <laughs> so how can we create memorable moments? Right? Well, I'm here to tell you that it's not about magnitude. It's about attitude. You gotta own it. My dad, from East Boston, regular guy, pharmaceutical salesman, Eli Lilly. He was a spectacular relationship architect because he understood the concept of janitors and kings, where it doesn't matter who they are. And he spent a lot of time in investing a lot of time in receptionists, the administrative help, just getting to know everybody because it's amazing how much administrative help tells you about the organization. They want to. If you ask people questions, they want to tell you stuff about them. So he would spend a lot of time investing in them as well as the doctors. And he'd call in and he'd say, hey, I want to come by today, drop off some samples. Is it a good time? A little bad time. So busy, they're not even going to be able to get out for lunch. And that was my dad's cue. He'd go into the North End, get a tray of pasta, get some other food. He'd bring it up to the doctor's office, go into the conference room, set it up, get some plates, get everything going. And then the receptionist would say, hey, everybody, Lou and Brianna from Eli Lilly's by, and he brought lunch. They'd all come by. He'd be serving them food. Now, this time when it was so busy that they weren't going to break away, not going to get a chance to eat, they have a nice hot meal, courtesy of my dad. Memorable moment. It's not about the size, the magnitude. It's about the intent. You can create them every day if you pay attention. There's that word again. Two words, I guess. Pay attention. OK. With anything of significance comes responsibility. Right? Everything has responsibility tied to it. If nothing else at the end of this talk that you come away with, I hope you come away with this. 
and I'm, a, I'm not a PhD. I never took a marketing class. I'm just basic down to earth. So this statement means a lot. It, 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 <laughs> it means a lot to me. Do what you say you're going to do. Pretty simple statement with powerful, powerful implications. If you always do what you say you're going to do, you are going to be credible. If you're credible, people are going to trust you. If people trust you, they're going to rely on you. If they rely on you, they're going to think of you first. And in business, you want people thinking about you first. I got buddies who, they're running around busy, they're crazy. You know, so busy at work, I can't get to my kids' games. I told my kid the other night, I was coming, I didn't make it. He was so disappointed. Of course he's disappointed, you moron. Okay, kids are fragile. You can't promise them you're going to do something and then not do it. Not only is it wrong, it's going to affect them very badly. It's going to hurt and erode your relationship. Now, I know that's much more important than a business relationship. But if you treat your promises to every business relationship as you would to your children, You'd be better off, although it should be the other way around sometimes, right? If I tell my son or my daughter I'm coming to a game, I'm coming to their game. And if I can't come to the game, I say, I'm sorry, hon, I can't come. And then if I show up, guess what? Who's the hero? You have to manage expectations. I always told my salespeople, if you can do something for somebody, it's okay to say yes. But if you think there's a slight chance you can't, you better say no, because that initial no sets the stage and the expectations. The expectations are, I can't get it done. Sorry, I can't get it done. But if you can deliver after you say no, wow, that's powerful. Because not only they, you told them you couldn't, but they saw that you took that extra effort to make it happen. It's impactful. People are just too fast. Yeah, yeah, sure, whatever you need. Whatever you need, yeah, I can get it done. If anybody's like that, be suspect. I call them Tasmanian devils. Because they're spinning, 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 and there's all this shiny dust, and you're like, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. And when the dust settles, it's an ugly animal. So stay true to the relationship and deliver on expectations. Now, if you're solid at relationship architects, you know how to deliver. But the best architects, or the best architect delivers, right? Dr. King, one of my favorite co quotes, the ultimate measure of a man, I'm gonna slash woman, but I know what he's saying, is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. When the you-know-what hits the fan, look to your left and look to your right. If people are there, you've built strong relationships. If you're standing by yourself, guess what? Take a deeper look in. Because anybody, when times are good, can be there. Anybody. It's easy. Oh, yeah, that's great. Good time. Having fun. When times are tough and you need real help, the people that come back and the people you can count on those are the relationships you built well. So, so S is the final letter in the acronym DELIVERS. This separates the true relationship architect from the pack. Because if you give of yourself, genuinely, think about it, who's, who's been in, in, in a jam? Who's been, everybody's been in a jam once in a while. The person who was there during that jam if they call you right now, wouldn't you do whatever you could to help them out? Of course. Of course. So in a business relationship, if you give of yourself. Now, all the way up to D, again, this is a, this is a discipline and a practice. Delivers is a discipline and a, a practice. All the way up to uh, S, that's just kind of a, a method for you to keep paying attention. And what I usually do is I try to throw in a letter in every interaction, oh, I, I, you know, that was good. This was, I gave a little I, I invested. Gave a little L. 
It's a discipline. S is a whole different ballgame. That's beyond discipline. That takes you just to a whole new level. A whole new level. So I hope when you uh, have a little bit more pizza and take off and, and, and think about what we talked about today, I hope that you will be a person who delivers to their relationship every single day. And I also hope you'll buy my book because this is only a small piece of the brilliance. <laughs> and there's, there's much more in this. So I appreciate you uh, spending some time with me. And I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about some you know, more detail with the Patriots or other things I've done. So thank you. Okay, don't all run up in front. Don't all rush to raise your hands all at once. You know, I love that question because I believe it's personal. I think whatever vehicle and mechanism that fits you and suits you, because for me, there's certain things that I just don't get. So some, some technologies may not work, some technologies may work. I mean, people say Salesforce, they love Salesforce. Other people say, you know what, I have my own little system in Outlook and I, and I know what I, you know, put everything down. Some people write in notebooks. I think whatever system allows you to deliver, that's what you use. No one should say, oh, that's, that doesn't work. It works if you make it work. And it works if it works for you. So there's a lot of great softwares and applications. And, and I mentioned Salesforce because that's one that a lot of our clients use, and they seem to like it a lot. I, I, I'm a believer in whatever works for you, make it work for you. Sure. So social media is great because in, in let's talk from a, from a business to consumer perspective. From a business, business to consumer perspective, it's a lot harder to build the type of relationships we were talking about. I was talking more about business to business relationships. But it's still the same thing, only on a larger scale. So when you build relationships, the way you listen to the mass market and the mass consumers, you survey them, survey monkey, you put out information, you start extracting information. And then you put these groups in different, in different slices in order to talk back to them. Social media is a great opportunity to engage with your consumers. They're, they're telling you what they want. If you're paying attention to the folks who follow you on Twitter and the folks that, that you're connected to and your friends on Facebook, if you pay attention to what they have to say, you really can understand what they're about. Because it's not about, I always tell people, when you're in business, it's not about creating, it's not about this idea you're creating in order to sell something. It's about knowing the consumer, and because of what you know from them, then you create what they want. If you give people what they want, they'll buy it. So engagement on social media, everybody's like, oh my God, social media, it's all new. It's, you know, I'm intimidated, I'm scared. It's not new, okay? The principles of social media have been around forever. The technology, now that's new. Back in the 70s, there was a technology called CB radio, right? Most of you weren't born then, some of you were. But the CB radio was, it was a, a way of do, doing business for a truck driver. They get on their little CB radio and they, they would say, break on nine, I'm heading down to uh, the truck stop. Anybody in the area want to stop by and have a cup of coffee, right? Twitter's not any different. Hey, we're going to be in this location. Anybody want to have a tweet up? Right? So the technology was you would broadcast a message to a radius, albeit a smaller radius. You would engage with people. Yeah, we're, come, we're, you know, we're going to be in that area. We're going to come, come by and stop by and see you. So there was engagement. There was broadcast. It's social media. Now, you're not doing a CB radio to Australia like you can with social media, so it, it becomes more powerful. But the principles are pretty much the same. And so you have to treat people the way they want to be treated. You have to engage with them. You have to be respectful. You have to listen. It's not new. 
you know, people get crazy, and I'm in sports. You know, Ocho Cinco tweeted the fact a couple of weeks, two weeks ago that, oh, my God, the team was awesome. They look great. Anybody see this in the news? All right, so Teddy Bruschi was up in arms. Teddy Bruschi was like, oh, my God. If you studied your book, you'd know they would be great. Your playbook. Well, I think Teddy Bruschi was a little overbearing. There's no harm in complimenting your team. It's not a bad thing. More people were complimenting their partners. That's a good thing. So social media is a huge opportunity. I know most people are on Facebook. And Facebook is OK. It's great to kind of communicate with your friends and your buddies. I mean, your real friends and real buddies. And if you have a page, it's good to find people if they like what you're doing. But I really like Twitter because, it's, to me, it's like talk radio. Gives you the opportunity to really talk to people and really understand them and really know what it's about. Uh, and so I would suggest, if you're not on Twitter, jump it on. Any other questions? Yes. Well, you know, we, the, answer, the answer would have been a year ago, yes. We, we were on ComAv up until, just right, you're not so far away, up until um, last September. And I, I hired someone in Chicago. I hired someone in Atlanta because the world is changing. And, and I didn't want people just in Boston. I wanted the right people. So we actually converted. we become virtual. So we're a virtual company, which any small business I would recommend highly because virtual networks, virtual phone systems, are better than the hardwired stuff half the time. So now I have two people in Atlanta, two people in Chicago, and four people in Boston. So it's great. Uh, we, we, and you'll read, you'll, you'll read about it once you buy the book, in the book, that we departmentalize the week. So instead of having a location in bricks and mortar, we take how, we structure how we operate like a department and, and like, a, like a structured organization. So on Mondays, I don't talk to anybody. Mondays I write strategy, I write blogs, I write for books, and I do all that other stuff. Tuesdays, there's new business meetings. I do new business meetings. I'm out with the crowd and trying to bring in new business. Wednesdays, the group gets together. So the people in Boston are together, and then we conference in folks, and we spend time going over, okay, this, was, this is what has to be done. This is where we have to go. This is what we have to do. What I found out being in, in Kelly, who's my, my chief marketing officer now, She's the one who said, Lou, you're, you're in and out. Everybody wants you. Every time you're in here, you're never getting anything done. So it's unbelievable how much more time and much more I can do because I'd come in on a Monday. You know, you get your cup of coffee. You start working on a project. Someone walks in. Hey, Lou, boo, boo. okay, yeah. Then there's a meeting. Then it's lunch. And before you know it, I'm back on my project that is a fourth of the way done. And I got to restart up my thinking process. And it just really bogs us down. We do more. So you're to, the long answer to your, your, your question is we're virtual. We don't typically hire right out of college only because we're, it's more strategy and consulting. And it's not a lot of, it's not a lot of um, administrative stuff because we all kind of work independently. So that little space where you're getting to know the business, we're wrong for that. But... Um, so I know that doesn't answer your question, but that's, that's how we operate. Any other questions? Before I, before I say goodbye, the, the one thing about the book that the relationship architecture is one section of the book. Um, it's the middle section. The two sections that are on either end are the marketing playbook, and that talks about how to structure an organization, how to structure your small business, how to structure marketing in order to be great at relationship architecture. And the last section is called the revenue game, and that's really how you convert these relationships into revenue. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're really in business all about. We want to generate revenue, right? Because we all want to have nice lives and be comfortable. So it's not, a, it's not dirty to say, I want to make money. It's good to make money, but do it in the right way. So hopefully you'll pick up the book and uh, like it and... Then when I write my next book, you can tell everybody about that one, too. I appreciate it. Thank you very much.